Well, that because I had my mic muted. Sorry about that, Calvin. <laughs> so welcome back to the stream, everybody. Uh, yeah, uh, so what I was just blabbering to myself for no one else to hear is that it's I still have that kind of vacation feeling. Uh, thank goodness Calvin joined in uh, as soon as he did. Otherwise, I would have gone a long time with my microphone muted. But anyway, I want to ease back into vacation. As I was saying, something's probably going to go wrong, and something already did. I didn't uh, unmute my microphone. I'm not sure why I was muted in the first place, but I think because I was raiding, and so I muted myself. But anyway, thanks for joining me, Calvin. Thanks, everyone else, for stopping in today. I got a couple ideas for stuff to do today. I already got the chat bot running, although it doesn't look like it's actually working. It should have picked up your, um, picked up your chat messages there, Calvin. Let me try it again. And I may have to. Oh, oh, oh! I yeah, that would be why, because I probably don't have. Oh boy, see, this is just all going sideways on me. So I have Couchbase server. Uh, it's not running right now. I actually had had uh, turned it off. I was doing some video rendering or something. So that's why it crashed. Uh, so let's see if we can get this running. And I'll just type in a test message here to see if it shows up. It doesn't look like it is. I wonder what the problem is here. Lots of stuff going wrong. This is the stream where everything goes wrong. Oh, now it's working. Just took a second to bootstrap, I guess. There we go. Probably because I just started Couchbase and it was still spinning up, so. We're all set. So sorry about that, Calvin. Your first two chat messages are not captured by the Twitch chatbots. But just a reminder that every chat message at this point will be uh, collected into Couchbase. Uh, not doing anything with them yet. But uh, you can see I've got a bucket here called Twitch Chat. It's got 393. I'll spawn some more nonsense at some point. <laughs> uh, so 393 uh, chat messages, all, all nonsense, all stored here in Couchbase as JSON documents. I can query them just to see like who is chatted the most, stuff like that. But I haven't really decided what I'm going to do with that data yet, other than just start collecting it. And maybe at some point in the future, We'll get some use out of it, which incidentally I think is the big data strategy of a lot of companies. Just collect everything and we'll figure something out to do with it later. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we're going to ease back from vacation today. I've got a couple ideas of stuff to do. Hopefully we can get something to go right today. Uh, but I want to give my normal plugs out to Team Live Coders, of which I am a member. This is a collection of Live Coders on Twitch and a Twitch team uh, that meet... Uh, certain criteria, you know, they're all, we're all coding about, uh, about, um, oh, interesting. Looks like, uh, InstaFluff here is doing something about databases. So that's super interesting. We might have to raid InstaFluff today. Anyway, uh, I'm not sure what comfy DB is. Sounds comfortable, but, uh, yeah, so I'm on a team of Twitch streamers. So right now InstaFluff is on the team. He's streaming. Nick Larson also streaming and then myself and then the rest of these are people who have at some point streamed with this team. And they're a bunch of cool people who are doing stuff with technology. They're building something, they're coding something, they're testing something, writing something. Uh, all You should check out this team here, team, slash team, slash live coders on Twitch. Definitely check that out. And the other thing I wanna point out is the awesome developers streaming list. This is just a GitHub repository. Also that lists, uh, why, do I, why do I keep, uh, we have two-factor authentication here. Uh, it also It's just a list, it's a text file of people who are streaming, again, developer stuff, tech stuff, coding, things like that. Uh, it looks like this is updated two days ago, so we'll have to check out to see if there's any new uh, database streamers on here. But here's the list, so it's just kind of a link to them and what they stream about typically. And so you can just do a control F here, and I like to search for data, so you can see myself there, Matt Groves, I stream a lot of databases, Couchbase, SQL, also some .NET, C Sharp, and stuff like that. Uh, as you can see, uh, what else is going on here? Rachel Tatman, Shirley Wu, Ted Young, and Go Maestro Go, Jack Mott. Yep, this is the same list before, so no one else has added any data stuff since I uh, last checked, but it has been updated 
two days ago. This list is updated often, so if you're interested in a topic and you want to watch a stream about it, I'm sure you can find someone on here who is streaming about uh, C Sharp or Python or what what have you. So check out the awesome developer streams list. And if you are yourself an awesome developer who is streaming, it doesn't have to be Twitch. It could be YouTube, Mixer, Facebook, Periscope, whatever. Get yourself added to this list. Okay, so that's that. What else we got? Uh, yeah, so I, all my videos, they get uh, saved to Twitch for a certain period of time, and I also export them to YouTube, so if you want to check out the long history, not just the full episodes, but also the highlights I edit little pieces of and, and split them out, you can go here, bit.ly slash grovestube, that'll take you to my YouTube channel, see all my videos, not just my Twitch streams, but all, all the YouTube videos I have on there, some, a lot of them are tech related, some of them are just random nonsense, um, and, um, Still experimenting with this uh, merchandise thing, Cafe Press, slash Matt Groves. I've got uh, like one design on there. I'm not really sure. That's also kind of an experiment as well. All right. TwitchBot is running. Vacation. Yeah, so I just got back from vacation. I took a uh, Alaskan cruise, a Disney Alaskan cruise. It was amazing. I love the Disney cruises. In fact, uh, while I was on board, we went ahead and put down a deposit on another cruise in the future. So... We are a cruising family at this point. Um, love, love the cruises. We had a great time. Went whale watching. Saw some whales. We saw like a, like a mother whale and like a calf. They were swimming together and uh, sort of flapping around and putting on a show for us. It was great. I haven't seen the pictures yet, but uh, my wife brought her like her DSLR camera. And got some really good pictures of the whales. So hopefully check those out later. That was that was a pretty cool experience. Really enjoyed that. Coral says, that sounds nice. I haven't done any in Alaska yet. Yeah, you're, you're a cruise guy too, aren't you? And you're actually a little closer to ports than, than we are in Ohio. I, I think if we live closer to a port like uh, Coral did, we would be cruising a lot more often. <laughs> like uh, my, uh, my mother-in-law lives in Galveston, which is a port city in Texas. And she cruises you know, probably four or five times a year. Not just Disney, but all kinds of different cruise lines. Love them. Coral, maybe you should go on the next uh, cruise with us. Um, we haven't decided where we're going to go yet. Probably not Alaska. Um, we're thinking we want to go down to um, Bahamas and um, Bay Bayonne, Bayonne, New Jersey. Is that how you say it? So you're, oh, you're actually sailing from New Jersey port. Interesting. I figured you went to the New York port, but uh, I'm guessing New Jersey is probably closer to you since you're in the, if I remember correctly, the Philadelphia area, maybe the King of Prussia area. Something like that. Anyway, uh, that's cool. That's, that might even be closer to us. I don't know if that, how that is proximity to Newark Airport, but uh, we might look at that one too. Yeah, so we're looking at maybe the Caribbean again, Bahamas, uh, because uh, there, Disney has a private island down there, and we've not gone on a cruise yet that, that uh, docks at the private island, so we like to check that out. Heard lots of good things about that, but for me... The cruise itself is not really about the, des the ports of call. It's about the ship. I love hanging out on the ship, all the entertainment, all the food. Everything's inclusive. It's just super convenient and relaxing. I love it. Compared to, say, uh, walking, around, um, walking around Disney World, for instance. Disney World's amazing, don't get me wrong. But you have to walk all around it. And it is, um, it is exhausting. It is huge, theme parks. So the cruise, pretty much everything is brought to you, or it's just a short walk away. You're a big fan of Royal Caribbean. All right, interesting. I've never been to Royal Caribbean. You know, I have two kids, so we felt like Disney Cruise would be really good. And beyond just the kid stuff, obviously, a lot of Disney stuff, the, the quality, the service of the Disney cruises is absolutely amazing. I was very skeptical of cruises going in, but I was blown away by the, by the Disney level of service and... Uh, the cleanliness and, and hygiene that they enforce on the ship. So I, I was very happy with that. Not throwing shade to other ones, but uh, I've not been on them, so I can't, I can't say or not. I've, you know, I've heard um, poor things about carnival cruises, but I've never been on one, so it, it's all just hearsay. Uh, yeah, so I, I, love, I love the cruises, and we're going to be on another one uh, before. We've got a deposit down for... Sometime in June 2021. So we'll be cruising sometime before then. Haven't decided where yet. We just put down a deposit. When you're on the Disney cruise, actually. Disney cruises are kind of kind of pricey compared to other ones. Um, 
I, I think it's worth it, but it's kind of pricey, especially if you have kids. Uh, but when you're on the ship, they'll let you put down a deposit for another cruise, and they'll give you 10% off the price of the cruise, which for Disney, that's huge. So we put down a deposit, uh, no-brainer. And it's actually a smaller deposit amount, too, when you're on the ship. Uh, if you're just tuning in, welcome to Cruise Chat. We decided to talk about cruise ships today because I was just uh, just came back from a, a vacation on a cruise ship in uh, in Alaska, and it was tremendous. We left out of Vancouver. Uh, we went up to uh, as far as Juneau, I think, Skagway and Ketchikan, and we even stopped at one of the glaciers, the Dawes Glacier, I believe. And I have an amazing picture of the Dawes Glacier. Um, if I get a second, it's on my phone, but if I get a second, maybe I will... Uh, uh, put it in Dropbox and, and show you, but it's this tremendous picture of the, of the Dawes Glacier. Star Trek cruises. Yeah, you know, there's lots of um, s- some theme cruises out there, like uh, comedy cruises. There's the Joko Cruise, which is, I think, a, a, a relatively f- well-known one amongst amongst the uh, comedy nerds. Uh, Star Trek cruises and stuff like that. Yeah, those are those are interesting. You know, um, with with me, I've got a couple kids, so you know, we don't really. Try, we try to stay away from the. We're not really interested in the adult. The adult. I'm, I'm not using the word adult in a, like, uh, you know, that way. But the the adult oriented cruises, right, where it's a lot of drinking and a lot of you know, comedy and entertainment things like that. So the Disney cruise is really good for uh, all the Disney content you'd expect. You know, they have they have content on there for adults, but it's really geared towards the kids. So maybe one day when the kids are older, the wife and I will just go on a cruise by herself. And, and uh, I don't know if she would be into the Star Trek cruise. She might. She's, she's watched a few, a few Star Trek series with me. She might be into that. Um, but one of the adult themes, one where it's like a comedy-themed one or something like that, where you, where you uh, go on the cruise. So, okay. So I'm always happy to talk cruises. And, and in fact, uh, to, just to kind of segue here a little bit, uh, Couchbase... Uh, as a company, we actually, uh, several of the cruise lines are our customers. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to name names or not, but uh, probably some of the ones you've heard of are Couchbase customers. Now, they're most likely Couchbase mobile customers because uh, it's an offline database, offline first database. And so it's perfect for a cruise ship because you can read and write data with all the apps and all the devices that are on the ship. And then when you get to some place where you can actually want to sync that data to a server or a data center, or you, you wait until some point where um, you, want to, you want to do a, a sync synchronization every so often because you know data at, at sea is, is expensive, uh, you can do that. So you can still do read and write operations. Much like on the Disney ship, uh, you have the app and you can chat with other people on the ship, and you can get a schedule, and the schedule gets updated and things like that. But it doesn't actually go out to the internet, unless you pay extra for that, of course. Uh, so the, the mobile app is, is perfect for, for cruise ship types, or the mobile database, I should say, perfect for cruise ships, uh, cruise, uh, cruising companies. Smells like CRDTs. I don't know what CRDTs are. Uh, CRDT, you don't have to clue me on that one there. Um, I could look it up, I suppose. CRDT. Uh, convergent replicated data types. Conflict-free replicated data types. Um, I don't know about conflict-free uh, because I know that uh, there are... Uh, I know the Couchbase Mobile... Oh, Sync Gateway specifically uh, gives you the ability to manage conflicts um, when, when it's syncing to the data. But... Uh, and I don't know enough about that that term. Plus, I'm not really like a mobile developer. Um, I'm more of the, the server side, back end database guy. So maybe uh, we can get um, Rob Hedgepeth on here at some point, or or on his own Twitch stream to to talk about Couchbase Server Mobile. And he's done some cool stuff, kind of showing how the syncing works. He's got you know two. Uh, like simulators on the screen side by side, one for iOS, one for Android, and he shows you make a change here, it'll sync over to the other one. It's it's pretty cool. Anyway, so I thought what I would dive into first is I wanted to show off something I've been meaning to show off for a while actually is uh, the query advisor in the upcoming version of Couchbase Server, which I think is very, very cool. Uh, it's something you've probably seen in other databases, something similar to it but it's relatively new to Couchbase Server. It's not been released yet. I think it will be, when it's released this year, it will be a developer preview. 
Uh, Coral, sounds cool. I like diving into the tech of distributed databases. Well, came to the right place. Couchbase is a distributed database. And uh, it's also written in Erlang, which we've discussed before, Coral, on the podcast, uh, which is a perfect language for uh, d- d- dealing with uh, distributed, uh, distributed data and, and, and networking stuff. It's not exclusively in Erlang, but, uh, but a big portion of it is written in Erlang. Um, and then, so once we get past that query advisor, that shouldn't take too long unless, you know, someone has a bunch of questions or we find some sort of tangents to go down, which we might. I thought about uh, doing a quick ASP.NET Core getting started guide with Couchbase. This is something that I've done in the past, just, uh, you know, 10, 15 minute videos for YouTube. And they're relatively popular. They, they get a lot of views, but I haven't updated one in a while. I think the last one I did was actually with ASP.NET. Um, or maybe it was ASP.NET Core 1, version 1. And we're all we're almost in version 3 right now. So I'll take a crack at, uh, at going through that and uh, maybe maybe using that as a highlight clip from this stream to create a, another video for that. So that's my plans for today. And as always, if you have any other questions you want to bring up, I mean, this is, you know, this is a loose guideline of stuff I'm going to cover today. But if anything else occurs to you, if you just have general questions about tech, you know, We've had people in here before who are asking about any advice for uh, going into a job interview that I'm going into in an hour from now. So anything like that is totally fine. As I've said in previous episodes, ask any questions you want to. The only stupid question is the one you do not ask. That's what my father always told me. So feel free to post your questions there in the chat room. I'll try to answer the best I can. Other people can chime in to help out. Um, anyway, thanks for uh, stopping in here, and we're going to get started here. So I had a Couchbase server up here. And this is a uh, an older build, but it's an internal build, 6.5, build 2796. I don't know what version we're on, what, what build we're on right now. This is not a version you can download publicly. Uh, you can't get this binary of Enterprise Edition um, publicly. But I have, I've okayed it with the, with the product management. It's okay for me to show it to you. Um, but just the caveat that this is an older internal build. It may be a buggy still. This has not been released. And actually... I, I, the thing I'm going to show off today, I did find a bug in it um, because of some dog fooding I was doing. And that, that bug has been fixed in newer builds of this that are internal, but I have just not gotten around to downloading and installing one of the newer builds. And also this is in, up here you can see in the top right, developer preview mode. Let me go ahead and get zoom it here. Go in. And uh, zoom in here, it's developer preview mode. So I've not only am I using an internal build, but I'm also got the internal build in developer preview mode, which will expose some features that are not supported uh, or will not be supported, and uh, but they'll be supported in future versions. So we're on like the cutting edge of the cutting edge here. Uh, I'll also get car next. I don't know if I'm gonna actually do any keyboard shortcuts, but just in case, all right. So uh, let's see, what can I do here to get started? All right. Um, so let's, I don't know, let's, um, you know, I've got the, uh, let's see, do I have any indexes on that? I don't. Okay. So uh, in the last episode I did, I brought in this Stack Overflow data. Which is this? Uh, which is all the results of the Stack Overflow survey, and I was actually doing querying of them with the analytics uh, engine, which is fine. Which is probably what you should do. Um, but what I've got here is I've also got a plain old Couchbase bucket, and this has lots of uh, documents in it that it just imported from CSV. But they look like this, right? It's a lot of flat data, well, mostly flat. I mean, there's some data here that uh, probably shouldn't be flat, but it's coming from CSV, so it is. And we've got all this data in here um, in our normal Couchbase bucket. So I'm just do a select count. We're not in an, uh, analytics right now. Uh, I'm going to do a select count from, and you can see down here on data insights, we've got survey results public. This is kind of, this data insights kind of, it's not a schema per se, but it kind of infers a schema from the data. It samples the data and says, here's what I think is in your bucket. This is the kind of data that's in there. So for instance, I've got, um, I've got, uh, I'm not sure why I have seven different schemas here in family photos, but uh, let's look at travel sample. So for the most part, it's, it's figured out there's four different types of documents in travel sample, route, landmark, hotel, and airport. 
and this is the percentage of documents that it found. It didn't look at every single document, it just sampled them to get an idea of what's in there. And then I can expand this to say, well, it looks like Landmark has these fields in it, uh, you know, uh, they have these fields in common. Because we're not enforcing any shape of data here, so we're just sort of inferring that shape of data. But you can see down here, I've got the survey results public, and right now, it's able to infer some schema, which is kind of interesting, and they all have the same exact field. But notice it says queryable by doc ID only. So I can't really query it in the same way that these are these fully queryable buckets can be queried. So for instance, I can go here and say survey results public, and I'll alias that with S. So I could get a count. There's 88,000 documents in there. The count does not require any sort of indexing. Uh, but let's look at this. Let's say I want to find, um, I don't know, let's just do this. Let's just say s.star, and I'll limit 10. Uh, so I, I can't do any query on this because there's no index on this bucket. So it says right here I should create a primary index or some other sort of index. Let's start by creating a primary index. This is an index that will basically be the equivalent of a table scan for the entire bucket, which means any query I run is going to have to scan every single one of these documents, all 88,000 of the documents, which is not good. Um, not good for relational, not good for NoSQL, it's just not good to scan all the documents like that. But I'd say in relational, sometimes you can get away with it because you have smaller tables, maybe only contain 100 or 1,000 records in them. A table scan is not going to take up a lot of time. Um, you still should index it properly, so you're not, you know, wasting uh, resources, wasting time. Um, but the idea here is that with a NoSQL database, you're scanning the entire bucket. And so it's not the same as a table. You're scanning all the data in the database, which that's going to get slower and slower and slower as the more documents you put in there. And some uh, NoSQL databases, some Couchbase customers, we're talking, you know, terabytes of data that you're scanning through. So that's just not a good idea to do a primary scan. But... We're going to start with there. It's, it's a good tool for development when you're, when you're uh, trying to figure out what query you should write because you don't necessarily want to have to build the indexes um, before you run the queries because you, you're kind of in development mode. Uh, in production, it's a bad idea. So I just want to go ahead and say that. Uh, always, always a caveat I like to say. So let's just look at this. Let's just say I want to select. Well, we can go back to that query. That was fine. So we're going to limit 10. So actually, that that's, was pretty quick. That limit 10 was pretty quick. That 22 milliseconds, that's that's uh, respectable. It's a small data set, though, 88,000. But now, let's say I want to... Um, uh, and and uh, So I want to demonstrate here is this advice button. And so this advice button looks at this query, and it looks at the, the plan. So here's the query plan. You can see like a visual representation of it. Uh, authorization, of course, but it do, it's doing that primary scan. So it's scanning every document. Um, now it's only limiting 10. I'm not sure exactly how that limit works. Um, it's, it's pretty cool that it's only doing 10. That's probably why it's so fast, because we're not actually scanning all 88,000. It'll fetch them, project the fields that I selected, and there's my limit. So it must have pushed down that limit somehow to the, to the primary scan. So very cool. Um, but let's say I want to do something like this. I want to find all the survey results where the age is, I don't know, let's say, let's say my age, uh, 39. All right. I'll go ahead and execute this. Now, this is going to take a while to run. This is going to be a pretty slow query. Because like I said, it's scanning every single document for that, uh, that age equals 39. Let's go to JSON here. So if it finishes at all um, in the, here in the browser, we'll see what happens, see how long this takes. This could take a while. Um, but what I want to demonstrate here is that, you know, this is a query. Okay, it, it's finished. So 27 and a half seconds is what it took to run on my local machine. You know, your results may vary because this is, a, as Coral is saying, a distributed database. So you could have multiple nodes with different processors and all kinds of different sizings and, and tweaks and things you can do. So that would not use this as a benchmark per se, except against my own machine. Uh, but 27 and a half seconds, that's too slow. We want to find all the users, all the results uh, of age equals 39. So that's too slow. What we can do, we create an index for that. Now, this is relatively simple. We just created an, an index on the age field. Uh, it's not always that simple, but let's hit the advice button here and see what advice has to say. So this should 
look at that query, look at the query plan, and then suggest an index to create. So here's it's what it's saying. It's saying here is the index you're currently using, the primary index. Here's what I recommend you create. Create an index on that age field, and that will make that query much faster. So remember, we're at 27 and a half seconds here. Go ahead and create that index. Mm -hmm. And actually, have to create the one time, right? So it's going to take a take a second here for it to kick off the index creation. And I I think there's some syntax if I want to fire it off and sort of do it um, asynchronously. But there we go, 20 seconds to create the index, which is fine. You only do that one time. Let's go back to our query. You remember it was what 27 and a half seconds to do this query, where age equals 39. So let's run it here. Now we've got the index created. It should be much faster. One second. So we get the same results, but it only took us one second to run that query. So there we go. And if we hit advice, we're going to see that it's using the query, or it's using the index we just created. And it's going to tell us that's probably the best you can do. So you can see here, it's using the age uh, index and it's, it's saying that's the optimal index and existing indexes are sufficient. Now, I don't know how this um, advisor works behind the scenes. Um, Chances are it's not going to be perfect and it probably will never be perfect in terms of what indexes it recommends and if the index is the best one or not. Uh, it's, it's probably going to be able to find, um, there's probably going to be situations where it's going to be local optimums, uh, local optimums. If you've not heard that term before, it's, you know, you have, imagine sort of a, well, maybe I can pick a picture of it here. Local optima, I spelled it wrong. There's always, there's this, yeah, here we go. So there's this, this type of mathematical concept where you, if you have different algorithms, you can find local optimas sometimes. So I could find these blue points. These are optimums. The global optima is the best we could do, right? Um, not, there's, it's tough to create an algorithm to f always find the global optima in all situations. So there may be some situations where it finds a local optima and says, okay, that's, that's sufficient for now. In this case, I happen to know that because this is the age field and every single document in this database contains an age field, this is the optimal query for that. But I'm just saying in the, in the future, these types of index advisors, they not just Couchbase, but in all kinds of databases, they have these advisors. They're not going to be always exactly right, exactly perfect. You still have to use your brain sometimes, unfortunately. So anyway, I've got the index created, and that's the cool thing I wanted to show was, was the index advisor there. So let's see if we can't uh, do it a little more complex. So this is the query that I did in analytics. This was oh, over a week ago. And uh, this one was in analytics of three and a half seconds, right? And this is the one, the complicated one that kind of figures out um, what language corresponds to influence on purchasing. Um, you know, we, we determined that Elixir, WebAssembly, and Erlang are the ones, for whatever reason, that people who use those languages have more influence on purchasing decisions than, say, Java, who have uh, relatively little influence on purchasing decisions in the aggregate. I don't know if this, any of this is correct or not. We're just sort of doing some crazy queries here. Let's try this query over here in, in Nickel, where we actually need indexing for it. And I've not tried this yet, so this could go horribly wrong. But let's uh, let's try this. Okay, so we've got a syntax error uh, at language. So language is probably a reserved word over here. That's interesting. Group by language. So uh, what, I, what I could do is I could I could uh, put back ticks around it to escape that. But let's change its name to Lang. That should do it. Uh, no bucket named SO, that's right. Uh, it's not called SO over here, it's called survey results public. Survey results public, okay. All right, so I'm assuming right now it's gonna be executing this query using the primary index. So this could be very, very, very slow. But I'm just curious to see what sort of index this advises us to create. I'm, I'm assuming it's going to be on the purchase what and language. Um, but we'll see, we'll see what happens. If it ever finishes. 
Okay, there we go. So it took about 30 seconds, 28 seconds to, uh, to execute that one. So let's bring up the advice. Okay. It's trying to find an optimal index for this relatively complex query here. Pat Pat one five six seven. Hello, how are you? I don't have any sort of um, uh, bot command like uh, like Bang Project there, because uh, I'm not really working on a individual project per se. We're just kind of playing around with some Couchbase. Uh, upcoming Couchbase server features, but uh, thanks for dropping in and saying hi. Uh, I do have a chatbot running. All it's doing is just collecting your chat messages for now, and we can query them if we wanted to. Um, but it's not really doing anything else. Uh, as you can see there, it, uh, you just said nice, and it just logged that message. So, um, And if you have any questions about anything, uh, you know, ask away. Uh, right now, we're, I'm kind of waiting on this, uh, this query advice to finish executing. Uh, and it's, uh, it's actually taking a long time to run. So as I mentioned, th this is all, this advice feature especially is, this is an older internal build. And it's a developer preview feature. So it's still very much in, in flux. A TLDR in Couchbase. Couchbase is a NoSQL document database. Data stored is JSON. It's distributed database. Uh, and... Um, Cool thing I like about Couchbase is that we have SQL. We can use SQL queries on it. Uh, that's the uh, short version of it. So if you're, I don't know what databases you're familiar with, but um, it's it's in the document database realm of, of NoSQL. So data is being stored as JSON. So um, you know, um, it's not like you're storing data in tables, tables, rows, and columns. You're storing data as individual pieces of JSON, which makes it very easy to distribute them because they're not relations. They're not related to each other. So you can split them up however you like to shard them amongst all the different machines in your cluster, which makes it very easy to scale them horizontally. So anyway, as I was, as I was sort of uh, a soft soaping here, this uh, is taking a long time to return some advice. Um, this, this may in fact be a bug for all I know, because this is an internal build. This is an older version of an internal build. Uh, so it looks like it's taking a long time to get the advice. So I, I may want to actually make a note of this for my own purposes to report this as an issue. Um, I don't know if it's just taking a long time because this is complicated or if it's a bug that's got hung up somewhere. So I'm going to make a little note to myself. Possible bug in Query Advisor. Uh, I'm going to just copy and paste this one over here. And I'm just going to say that uh, after, uh, I don't know why it's not doing that, but anyway. Um, oh, because it's the same line, that's why. And this uh, query advisor sort of hangs after a few minutes. Or not after a few minutes, but um, isn't finished. In a few minutes, I would expect the query advisor to be no slower than the actual actual query that it's advising on. Could absolutely be wrong on that, but um, like I said, I've not done this before, so looks like that's uh, just not going to cooperate. So let's just try a hard refresh here, and and maybe I'll try it again. Okay, so that's the same query. Let's see if we can get advice this time. And let's just look at the uh, behind the scenes, see if there's any errors being returned that are being swallowed up. It could be, you know, it could be a UI error, um, or it could be, you know, uh, actual error on the on the server itself. Unknown advice response. Oh, look at that. That's interesting. Okay, so that is definitely worth. Uh, that is definitely worth noting as well, in my bug report. JS error. Okay, and that is from. Uh, what is this file called? Q 
QW Query Service JS. So, all right, very interesting. So, what we've done here is I've found an actual, possibly a bug. Now, the problem with this is that, like I said, I'm an older version of the internal build. So, this might have been fixed uh, since this version was built. So, what I really need to do is get on installing a newer internal version. But there we go. So, I found potentially a bug. That's always good to do that. That's, that's why you dog food um, your, your own stuff. So, you know... Uh, when this goes out in the wild, that you've you've run it, you put it through its paces. Anyway, uh, this uh, this advisor, it's you know, like I said, it's it's still unreleased, and it will it will be in developer preview even when it is released later this year. Um, so it's definitely a work in progress. But that's the idea: is that uh, you have a query, uh, you know, if it's beyond a simple one like this, if it's a little more complicated than this one. It may be tough for you to decipher what is the best query for me to write. In fact, if I go to the Couchbase forums, there's a, there's a nickel forum for this query language, and most of the questions there are, help me write an index for this query. So that's kind of the response to, to that is, well, here's an advisor. And this won't be perfect. You know, you're still going to have to use your brain, uh, but it will help solve a lot of those uh, problems of, well, I don't understand what query I should write or what index I should write for this. In my own personal experience from the relational world, um, creating indexes is, is a skill that um, doesn't get exercised enough, <laughs> to, put it, to put it nicely. Uh, you know, lots of developers know how to create tables and write queries and do joins, things like that. But when it comes to, the, uh, to creating indexes, uh, you know, a lot of times you don't, you don't feel the pain of not having an index until too late. Uh, or uh, it's just, you know, you, you sort of copy and paste uh, from Stack Overflow to create an index. So it's good to have this kind of tool in here, this advice tool. It's one of my favorite things about the upcoming release of Couchbase is that, is that advice tool. Okay, so we've gone over that a little bit. Uh, I'm going to do more on that, some more content on that later. I'll probably write a tutorial on that at some point, maybe even make a a dedicated video just to that advice once I have a, a newer version of this internal build installed or potentially when we have the beta version released here and that will be coming up uh, probably maybe sometime this summer. I don't, I'm not going to put a, a date on that, but it, uh, we should have a beta version for you to download of 6.5. All right. So that was, uh, that was interesting. We didn't quite go the direction I wanted to, but we got some interesting uh, data we can create into a, a bug. And uh, so what I want to do next is, this is a question I get sometimes on YouTube and every once in a while as, as uh, other channels on Twitter or blog comments is, hey, I liked your ASP.NET Core getting started video with Couchbase, but it was with uh, an older version of ASP.NET Core and or an older version of Couchbase. Would you please update that for me? So I think that's what I'll try to do here is we'll just go through and we will uh, open up Visual Studio. 2019, and I will create a new, if I can bring it over to this other screen here, oh, here we go, we'll create a new project, uh, ASP.NET Core, probably Web API project, that will do the basic CRUD operations with Couchbase, you know, create, read, update, delete, and so that will probably involve a, a, writing a query, we're going to do some dependency injection, and we're going to do some uh, connecting to the Couchbase cluster and managing that bucket, things like that. The really, really basic stuff you need to get started with, with ASP.NET Core and Couchbase. I'm going to do that after I take a short break. So let me put up a little screen here. I'll be right back, taking a five minute break. So there you go, it's on the screen there. I will return briefly.
All right, I'm back. Thanks for hanging out with me. You know, sometimes just need to take a little little break. Um, but also, while I was taking a break, I grabbed a couple uh, a couple of the souvenirs from my uh, cruise since uh, I'm still I'm still kind of in vacation mode. So I thought I would show some of these off to you. So uh, one of the things on the Disney cruise ships that you can it's totally optional. It's actually not an official Disney activity. It's what they call a fish extender. And there's, a, there's like a little fish that's uh, it's right outside your room, right outside your, your stateroom. And what families will do is they'll, they'll put a hanger there. It's like a little, uh, like a shoe tree almost, but, but thinner. And uh, what you do is you sign up on this fish extender list and you bring gifts or, or purchase gifts or make gifts or whatever that you give to other families, other staterooms on the ship. And in return, they, you know, other families will, will give you gifts. Just a fun little activity you can do to, um, you know, uh, bring a little bit of extra Disney magic to, uh, to all the kids on the trip. And uh, what I, here's one of the things I actually got in the fish extender. And what you do when you sign up for the fish extender is you, you specify, like, oh, here's my age. Um, here's my allergies. If you're, if you're going to uh, uh, bring some treats for someone. Here's my favorite Disney character. And I wasn't really quite sure who to put down my favorite Disney character. Obviously, it's going to be someone in the Star Wars universe. But I decided to go a little more traditional Disney here. And uh, my, my favorite sort of traditional Disney animated character is Emperor Cusco from The Emperor's New Groove. I think it's hilarious. Voiced by David Spade. Uh, the, cart the show also has uh, John Goodman and uh, Patrick Warburton. Fantastic. And so I put down Emperor Cusco. And so what someone got me, if you can, if you can see it here or not, is this uh, very nice insulated coffee mug drink container that has a, well, kind of not working so well with the camera. Hold it still here. It's got a picture, uh, like a silhouette of uh, Cusco as a llama, and it says no touchy on there. No touchy. Which is, which is perfect, because that's hilarious. And also, my daughter has a habit of taking my coffee mugs uh, for her own, like, her own purposes, her own, her own drinks or whatnot. So... Uh, mine says no touchy on it now, and uh, hopefully that means they will not touch it. Very cool. The other thing, this is nothing particularly uh, Alaskan about this, but I bought myself a, a tin of chocolates from Ketchikan, Alaska. These are milk chocolate sea salt caramels, and I got addicted to these sea salt caramels uh, on a recent trip out to uh, uh, Portland. I was working with the couch base uh, training, uh, training team there. And they happened to have this big jar of these uh, salted caramels. And I just couldn't stop eating them. Uh, and I've had trouble finding them uh, in any decent quantity here in Ohio, for whatever reason. Probably at a Costco or something, right? Um, so I found them in the gift shops in Alaska, so I bought myself a few tins. And for your listening enjoyment right now, I'm going to actually eat one of these. Now these are milk chocolate sea salt caramels, which I'm, I'm definitely a fan of milk chocolate over dark chocolate. However, when it comes to these sea salt caramels, I will take either milk or dark chocolate. For any of those, anybody listening who wants to buy me a Father's Day present, for instance. All right, here we go. Oh, yeah. That's some good stuff right there. I'm not sure you're supposed to take a bite of them or put the whole thing in. You can really taste the uh, the Alaskan sea salt. No, probably not. These are probably manufactured by Nassau Candy in Hicksville, New York. So these come all the way from New York to Alaska. And I bring them back to Ohio. Absolutely delicious. That at, at this um, in Portland is this, this meeting room. They had a a canister. It was the size of well, I don't know, like a jumbo coffee can full of these caramels, and I was just popping those things like crazy. All right, delicious. I hope uh, I th looks like I lost some viewers maybe because I was eating on the air. So sorry about that. Just need a little break. Okay. Let's create a new project. I'm going to create a new ASP.NET Core project 
using Couchbase, and I'll be implementing the basic CRUD operations. I'll be doing a, a web API project, I think. So let's go ahead and create a new project. And it'll be an ASP.NET Core web application. And we're going to call this one um, ASP.NET Couchbase Starter. Let's just call it Starter. And I'll put this in my normal folder zproj and create. So it's going to create a basic shell of a project there. And I can choose what kind of web project I want to. Uh, we could create completely empty, Blazor is an option, we've got uh, web applications. I'm going to go with API, just to keep things simple. We're not going to do any UI work, it's going to be all API here. .NET Core and ASP.NET Core 3.0, which I don't think is fully released. Yeah, we're in Preview 4 right now. That's what I have here, which is fine. It'll look about the same uh, to ASP.NET Core 2.0 as far as the Couchbase stuff goes. So we'll go ahead and create that. All right, it's on my other monitor right now. There we go. Oh, I've got a Visual Studio update. I'm going to skip that for right now. I'll do that later. So here's the basic core of the project that's created for me. Uh, we've got a, uh, a single controller. Open that up here, it's called values controller. And right now it's not connected to any sort of database, so it's just returning hard-coded values. But you can see we've got uh, a git we've got, uh, that returns everything. We've got a git that returns a specific ID. We've got a post that will create a new object. We've got a put that will update an object. Uh, and we've got delete, which will delete an object. So let's go ahead and implement all of these, except using Couchbase behind the scenes. Uh, so the first thing we'll do is we'll go to start up here and we'll start uh, by, we need to connect to Couchbase. Now uh, to do that, we're gonna to need to bring in the Couchbase SDK. What I'm going to do to skip a step here is I'm going to look for the Couchbase and I want it to be the uh, dependency injection extension. Right here. So couchbase.extensions.dependency injection. This is an open source project uh, that was created by um, Brant Burnett. Well, it says right here Brant Burnett. And uh, we'll go ahead and install that. Installing that from NuGet. That's a relatively popular one, 46 and a half thousand downloads so far. And uh, what we'll do here is now we're in the startup.cs. So we'll go ahead and uh, uh, we'll do uh, in configure services, we'll say services dot add couchbase. And inside of this, we can say, uh, uh, we, can, we can specify all the different material like servers and things like that. We could also say configuration dot get section, whoops get section and we'll say couch base. Give me that couch base section of the configuration. And the configuration is going to be in uh, this app settings file here. Again, this is just sort of the default template. So we'll create a couch base section here. And we'll say give all the configuration servers. Uh, we'll just do local whoops. Why does that? It keeps putting that outside the quote. Why are you doing this to me? Uh, localhost 8091. We can specify a whole list of servers there. Uh, yeah, again with the colon. The Couchbase is distributed, so we can specify multiple servers here. It only needs one to get started, to get bootstrapped, but we can specify a whole list in case one of them goes down. And we'll say a username. Administrator. Password. Password. These are terrible credentials. Don't absolutely do not use those. A comma there, and um, and yeah. As, so is there actually? Do I specify a bucket here? I'm trying to remember. X dot buckets. I don't think so. 
So uh, that's that. And then down here, we'll say, do I need to do anything? App.use couchbase? No, I don't think so. Um, but what I do need is, let me actually go over to, let me bring up the uh, couchbase extensions, uh, dependency injection. So this is actually on GitHub slash couchbase labs slash couchbase dot extensions. There's a number of extensions. We're looking at dependency injection right now. And what I'm looking for is, okay, so this is what I did already, add Couchbase. What I'm looking for is, not, not that yet, but down here, shutdown, yes. So uh, when the app shuts down, we want to actually release any of the resources that we, we uh, have a handle on. So in the configure, I'm going to have application lifetime. Add that in there. Uh, doesn't it like him. I'm doing something wrong. Application lifetime. Oh, it's deprecated. Oh, that's interesting. Um, I host application lifetime. So, interesting. So that's another, uh, probably something I need to, um, we need to submit an issue, if it's not already been done, to this extension. So I'm going to make another note. We're making notes all over the place here. Uh, dog food style notes. Now, where is my? Uh, yeah, here we go. So, um, update to Couchbase extensions documentation. There, uh, I want to uh, my application lifetime is deprecated. And hopefully we can use I host application lifetime instead. That should be a relatively whoops, let me say that. Relatively simple change to make, assuming the rest of this works. This part right here. Actually register an event. And it looks like that still exists. So we've got this application lifetime has a number of different events. One of them is application stop. So when the application is stopped. We're going to actually execute this code in here, and all we need to do is give me the lifetime service and then close it. So we want to make sure that we release the connection to the Couchbase cluster. That's a relatively expensive resource. Uh, we want to release that at the end of the application, when that application stops. We don't need to uh, be you know, getting that and releasing it on an ongoing basis. We just need to get it one time at the beginning and then release it at the end. All right, so I want to make sure I had that part in. And the other thing, while we're here, this kind of shows some great examples about how to get started as well. Um, but uh, what you can do is, you, at this point now, you can actually inject buckets. You can inject this I bucket provider, uh, and with that bucket provider, you can say, "Well, give me a bucket and give it the bucket name." So that's one way you can do it, and that's totally fine. And that's probably what I'm going to end up doing. But the other thing you can do is you can actually inject bucket names, and so you can create sort of this marker um, interface here uh, that that names it. So you can say, "Well, uh, for this bucket, my dash bucket, we're going to mark it with I my bucket provider. So that point forward, whenever I inject I my bucket provider, I'm no longer passing in a string. I'm just saying get bucket. So that string is only in one place now, in the configuration, instead of inside each individual uh, controller. So in the long run, that's probably what you want to do is is mark it like that. Especially if you're an application that's using multiple buckets, which ours is not going to. But if you're in multiple buckets, that's probably a very useful thing for you to do. Or if you're changing the bucket name on a regular basis, for whatever reason, um, you know, different environments, you might want to do that as well. So I'm not going to go ahead and do that yet. Over here in Values Controller, I'm going to put in a constructor now because I now have I bucket provider that I want to come in here. I will call this bucket provider, and we'll just. Say bucket equals bucket provider dot get buckets, and what should we call our bucket today? You know, I think since we've been talking cruise ships so much, let's just call it um, let's just call it cruises. We have a bucket that contains cruises. So I'll create a field there. That's a resharper shortcut to create this bucket object. So at this point now, what I want to do is I'm going to implement each of these operations to interact with the Couchbase uh, cruises bucket. First, I should create the cruises bucket. So we'll log in here to Couchbase. 
Again, this is an internal build, internal um, build with some public features or some developer features enabled. So we'll create a new bucket here and we'll call it cruises. And we'll just give it the minimum quota. No reason to get too fancy. We're not gonna put a ton of data in here right now. We'll just uh, give it the minimum memory quota of 100 meg. Wait till that uh, fires up there. I should also point out that I have a large collection of buckets here. Um, you probably need to be careful about the number of buckets you create. Uh, you know, we have some limits, some guidelines around that. This is probably too many. Um, but fortunately for me, I've got a pretty beefy machine and a pretty small amount of documents in each of these, in these buckets. But if you're going to a uh, distributed configuration, the number of buckets it can be problematic when you're talking about network traffic. So you want to be very careful about the number of buckets you create. The guideline is, I think right now it's uh, maybe a hard limit of 10. Uh, probably the fewer that is, is better. Uh, some of those guidelines may be changing in future releases. Uh, and we already talked about some of the multi-tenant stuff coming up in new, new versions of Couchbase. Go back to a previous episode or two and you can see some, uh, some talk about that. Uh, I just wanted to comment that since I have a lot of buckets on the screen here, uh, generally speaking in production, you probably want to stick to a smaller number of buckets. Okay, so we got Cruises bucket created. I've already got those credentials created that we sh uh, showed here uh, in the app settings is administrator and password. Not good credentials, but uh, good enough for uh, simple local usage. So now I've got this bucket object. It's time to actually, uh, let's say, um, uh, what we, should we create documents first or should we get documents first? I guess we probably need to create them first, right? So we've got this uh, post here and it's uh, looking for a string from the body. We're gonna do something more, more complicated than a string. So let's create a folder here, call it models, and we'll create a cruise class. So we have our cruise. And so let's, what, what are the characteristics of a cruise that we need to store in our application? So we can say uh, cruise line. And we'll just leave that a string, but that could be like Disney, Royal Caribbean, Princess, um, and even Carnival, I suppose. And we could say um, public date time, and we could say start date. All right, and um, number of days. And we could also say, we get a list of string, and this is going to be ports of call. All right. And then normally in a uh, relational database, that would probably be a separate table because this is a, a list of different um, objects, right? So that would be a, a foreign key type relationship. But we're doing JSON data. We can just stick that right in the same piece of data. No need for an ORM or any sort of mapping there. So ports of call and uh, I don't know what else. Uh, maybe one more field here. Um, maybe the... Uh, uh, ship name. So like Disney has Disney Wonder, Disney Magic, Disney Dream, and so on. I'm sure the other ones have uh, similar types of names. So that's good. We've got a, a cruise there. And so instead of a string, we're going to look for a cruise coming in. And to, to save this, all we have to do is say bucket.insert and cruise. Oops. We're going to give it a type of cruise. And we'll say new document, we'll type cruise, and we'll give it an ID of a GUID. Just a randomly generated GUID there, and the actual document itself, content, will be the value coming in. Now, this is a little unsafe because we're not doing any validation on this cruise object that's being saved into the database. Uh, we actually don't need this, this is just redundant. Uh, so what we should probably do is some validation here. Uh, so we're creating a new cruise. And what we should do is we should say, all right, well, uh, if the value dot uh, cruise line, we can say if string is null or empty of the value dot cruise line, then we can return bad request. Uh, you must specify a cruise line. Oh, I missed a parenthesis. It doesn't like this. Why not? Return type is void. Okay, we'll make this action result. I action result actually. 
All right. And we can do a similar thing. We can say is null or empty value dot uh, ship name. Turn bad request. You must specify a ship name, etc. So I'm not going to go through all of those, but we'll put some simple validation in there. This is all we need here to insert the data into the actual bucket. And then um, we can return OK. Uh, cruise was created with ID. And uh, let's, let's just return the ID. Probably a good idea to do that. Uh, so to do that, I'm going to create a variable with the ID. Just still going to be a GUID. Place that right here, and there we go. So when I post to that endpoint, it should save a document into Couchbase, and it should perform some validation on it. Just some more validation here, and save it into the database. So let's give it a shot and see uh, see what breaks. Doing this all on the fly here, so stuff may break. I may have forgotten something. Okay, so far so good. Let's bring up uh, Postman here to deal with this. So we've got a connection refused. What's the problem here? Hmm. Did I get a step here? Uh, so this is this looks like a Couchbase error message to me. Yeah, Couchbase create bucket wasn't able to do that. What did I forget? Couch base. Let me bring up the documentation here. Couch base configuration get section. Yeah, yeah. Okay. That's right. Bucket provider. Uh huh, uh huh. Everything looks right there. So let's go back and take a look at maybe some examples. Um, for the dependency injection. I feel like I've done this a million times, but probably, so I'm probably figuring something really fundamental here. Uh, servers, password. Yeah, this is, uh, seems right here. Examples, check out the integration tests. Like a test app, integration tests, like look at some examples. Okay, I want to look at startup mainly. And yeah, good section couch base. So this is in the, uh, where is it? app settings, JSON. So the only thing I'm seeing different, well, it's using this for some reason. But it's also specifying the buckets here, which I don't, oh, it's using connection string too. Okay, it's using connection string instead of servers. That would explain why it's different there. Configuration of JSON. But it's using servers here, so that should be fine. Well, I'm going to just copy this over here. So it's mostly the same, except this is uh, cruises instead of default. What doesn't like about this? All right, let's try it again. See if it likes that. Connection refused. What am I doing wrong? Cannot assign requested address. Hmm, hmm, hmm. So that's right, as you can see over here. That's the correct address. Uh, let me just make sure. Uh, I know it's administrator password. Hmm. What am I doing wrong? Well, I, I, I think, I'm not sure what I'm doing wrong there, but uh, we could just hard code it here. See what the deal is. X.servers. I'm, I'm guessing it's something to do with uh, my configuration file. One 
and this is excellent username. Is it, is that the casing right? Username, password, yep. Username equals administrator x dot password equals password. So it should work. I'll see why I wouldn't. Hmm. Connection refused. Oh, um, wait a second here. So I have this pencil injection installed. Couchbase net client is 5.9. Is it, is it possible that, well, I don't think that's right. I was thinking maybe the SDK is an older version for some reason, but I don't think that's the problem. Oh, this doesn't make sense. This should be fine. <sighs> I'm not sure why I need this buckets in here anyway. Oh, what a loud host is doing out there. Couch base, username. Password. Could not bootstrap. Well, this is really annoying. Especially because I've done this like a million times. And there's no reason why I shouldn't be connecting. Let's go over it again. It's always something stupid that I miss. Space extensions. Uh, dependency injection. All right. Yep, this is what I'm doing exactly. Does it need to be registered before other services? I don't see why that would be the case. Uh, but I'll just try that just to be sure. Um, oh, yep, I did that already. Injecting Cosmos buckets. Yeah, 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 that's fine. We're not even getting that far yet. Shut down. Yeah, that all seems fine. So, the only thing I've done different here is I've moved add couch base above add controllers. Don't see that why, why that would make a difference. And it didn't. Uh, why is it connection refuse? That's very... Oh! Am I running it in Docker? Well, that might be the reason. Let's just run it IS Express. Well, there's, there is no couch base inside of Docker, so that would probably be the reason why it's not connecting. There we go. Well, that was annoying. But now we got it working, so... Okay, so it's returning the hard-coded values from before. So I'm going to bring up uh, Postman here. Uh, I'll just bring it over here on the screen. Let's save. So one, well, let's see. I'm going to be, uh, where is it? We're going to post to API values. We're going to post something from the body here. So, whoops, hold on. This is right here, API values. We're going to post there. And it's going to be a body of raw, and we're going to make a JSON. No authentication. And this should give us some error messages, at the very least. Uh, server can, can I get any response? Is it, uh, it's a post API value. Hmm. What, what, what do I, localhost API value. That's the body, that's the header, yeah. What's the problem here? I 
uh, you know, I was hoping I could just take a clip of this video and export it to be the tutorial, but we're running into so many of these really just annoying issues that I'm going to have to redo this at some point. So let's we'll just work through this and figure out what I'm doing wrong. Making this Hello World app for the millionth time. This is a post. Um, you know, I, I specify a route, I guess. API slash. You know, it, it should. It sh oh, you know what? Is it API? Yeah, API slash values. That, that should do it. It should, it should have done it before. Let's uh, let's see what we can do here. Okay. So it's not getting any any response. Which, oh, uh, yeah. four four three one four slash API slash values. It's a post. I'm giving it an empty JSON. Oh, I don't know. Give it something else. Yeah, it should make a difference. Nope. Because the git's working fine, as you can see here. Why isn't the post working fine? Very confusing. I'm doing a post request, right? This is a post. Yeah. Is it API value? No. Should be values. It just is an error connecting. Huh. All right, well, uh, this has got to be a routing issue, I'm assuming. So why don't I just make this more explicit? Slash uh, value, values. Like that. API slash values, yeah. That's what it's supposed to be doing anyway. Oh my goodness. Let this be a lesson to new developers out there maybe that I've been doing this kind of stuff for ever and I'm still struggling with just getting the basic hello world to work. I don't think this is an ASP.NET Core problem. I think this is a me problem. I don't know what I'm doing wrong here. This, I mean, this API and this controller should be replaced by this here. This should be the value that replaces API slash values. And as a post, it should post API values. That should work. Does it need to be, I mean, is the interface a problem here? I don't think that would be the problem either. Yeah, so the hard code value should return. Yep, 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 yep. Postman, send, and nothing. Why do you do this to me? Hmm. I mean, I don't know. Let's just back to the way it was and see what happens here. Um, value plus equals foo. Just like set a breakpoint in here. See if it actually gets hit. There may be something else I'm doing wrong that's throwing an error. I don't I don't know. I'll step through it. Some debugging. Just to see if that actually is getting hit. Okay, send, no response. 
Oh man, this has got to be something so. It's gonna be something right in front of me. Seems like none of these are getting hit at all. Except for this one. What, what, what am I doing wrong here? It's not even getting... It's not even getting this one. That's a get. It should be returning... Well, let's see. No body for this, right? Okay, what's up with this? What's going on here, postman? What am I doing here? Localhost 44. I can find it in the browser, okay? Hits the breakpoint in the browser. Why isn't it hitting it when I'm when I'm uh, doing it in postman? That's a weird one. I don't know. What is going on? It's the exact same URL. The postman is barfing on it. Is it uh, SSL or something? Oh my goodness. Could not get any response. I know the back end is working properly. Uh, SSL verification, something going on there, settings. Uh, file settings, general. Maybe something with the SSL. Ah. That's weird. Okay. There's a postman problem. It's welcome welcome back to live yak shaving with Matt Groves. Good gravy. Okay, let's try a post now. All right. So this should give an error message. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, JSON. That's what I want. I should hit a break. Uh, one more validation errors. Yeah, okay. So... Let's let's go back to what I was doing before. That's what I should rename the show is just Yak Shaving with Matt Groves. This should be Cruise again. So back to where I was. Jeez Louise. Oh nope, this needs to be action result. Okay, postman, send, and okay, there we go. You must specify a cruise line. Perfect. Cruise line, and we'll say Disney cruise line, or DCL. I'm a DCL silver member. Must specify a ship name. Ship name is the Disney Wonder. And cruise was created. Okay, so it's not exactly what I want because I don't have all the validation in there. But we've got the C part of the crud working here, it looks like. Go to buckets, cruises. We've got a document in there, and it is the yep, Disney Cruise Line. It's got a default date value, which we don't want. That's bad. Number of days is zero. Also default, we don't want that. And null ports of call. So we don't want that either. So why don't we just go ahead and add some... Since we're already off the rails anyway, let's just add some validation here. If value dot ports of call equals null or value dot, or is not the case that value dot ports of call has any, then return bad request. You must specify ports of call. Now I know technically speaking, there are some cruises that don't have ports of call, but we can call the beginning port a port of call. We can just assume that. Keeping our validation simple. If value dot num days um, is less than or equal to zero, right? Uh, then we guys return uh, 
Number of days must be a positive number. You have a cruise of zero days or less. Doesn't make any sense. And uh, what else? We got start dates. Start dates. Um, uh, let's see. So your start date um, is less than or equal to. I don't know. Uh, let's just say it has to be. Uh, has to be a uh, future date and time. Again, doesn't necessarily make sense, but um, it doesn't. I mean, it doesn't necessarily going to be the perfect business logic here. But uh, we'll just do it for our validation purposes. You must specify a future cruise date, cruise start date. Okay, and so back over here, we'll delete our invalid item. Start it again. Okay, send this. We'll show you the new error message. We'll specify ports of call. So that is what? Ports of call? Is that what I called it? Back over here. Uh, ports of call. Yep. Okay. So ports of call. We're going to put uh, catch a can. We'll put uh, Juno. And we'll put Skagway and Dawes Glacier. Because that's just the one I was on. Those are all the ports of call. Dawes Glacier isn't uh, actually a port per se. They, they refer to it as a port of call. It's just a glacier. And so they park next to the glacier and they send out some ships. In fact, let me bring up a picture of it. Um, this might be a good time. To take a little break here and, and show you that this is a really great picture. I, I just captured this with my cell phone, just kind of a spur of the moment sort of thing as we were um, parked by the, uh, by the Dawes Glacier. Just upload this to Dropbox real quick and I'll show it to you here on my screen world's tallest tin soldier yeah we were next to that that was in Vancouver uh, let's see Dawes Glacier where are you that's the one right there this is a uh, panoramic picture my, my phone can take uh, panoramics. Uh, you just sort of hold the phone up and you move it across like this slowly. Sometimes it turns out okay, sometimes not. This one I think turns out pretty good. I've only seen it on the small screen until just now. But here it is. This was, you can see kind of in the middle there. That's Dawes Glacier. Maximize it here. Uh, I mean, you can't really, I mean, it, it's, it looks so much bigger when you're there in person, but uh, you can kind of get an idea. This is, they, they turn the ship so that the, uh, you know, you, you, you head straight into this little bay kind of area where the glacier is, and they turn the ship sideways so that the length of the ship, I'm guessing this is going to be the port side of the ship, is facing the glacier. So we get all these great views. And you can see they had uh, someone in a mini costume here taking pictures with people in front of the glacier, that sort of thing. But I'm, I'm a tall guy, so I just held my phone up really high and took this big panoramic photo here. And this is a great shot because shows these really awesome mountains surrounding the glacier the glacier right there in the middle of course we've also got these two little excursion ships they sent out from disney cruise and they're both sort of converging on the glacier it's a very cool picture very happy with how this turned out sometimes in the panoramics when people move around it kind of messes up the picture um, but for the most part this looks like a really great shot not a lot of blurry people or or deformed looking people in this shot and it's just I mean, this massive blue sky, these huge mountains, this glacier there. It's just really, it was quite a sight. It's, it's, it's breathtaking. It's, it's one of those things where a picture, as good a picture as this is, I think, it doesn't really do it justice. It's kind of like uh, if you've been to the Grand Canyon before. I'm sure you've seen pictures of the Grand Canyon uh, in magazines and in school and, and on TV and whatnot. But actually seeing it in person is just incredible. It's just one of those things you have to see in person to really understand the, the scale and the beauty of it. So uh, this is one of the two glaciers we actually saw on the, on the trip. Uh, this is the only one we stopped at. There's another one we saw that was close to Juneau, I believe. I can't name the glacier there. But uh, we were going on an excursion. We took a bus, and they pointed out the glacier. Hey, there's a glacier over there. It's, uh, uh, I forget what it was called, but uh, one of the big glaciers near Juneau. Very cool stuff. And actually, uh, my brother-in-law went on an excursion to 
one of the glaciers and you actually got it right up to the glacier and uh, there's there's what they call melt coming off the glacier just water you can go fill your water bottle up with some with some glacier water it's very cool uh, I didn't get to go on that one but he, he described it, it sounded like a very cool thing to actually go up there and touch a glacier and be right next to it it just it says it's gonna be very cool but anyway I, I can't uh, recommend uh, the Alaskan cruise enough it's all the way up and down we saw this kind of scenery these huge mountains trees and coastlines everywhere it was just absolutely amazing all right so there we go we got our our ports of call what else uh let's see num num days so my cruise was a seven day cruise and the last one is uh, date started right start date start date and mine was i don't know 2019 was it uh, 06, 03, something like that? So let me beautify this up a little bit. So that's the object we're going to post. And, oh, I've got to specify future. So I, I did it wrong already. Um, so let's uh, specify a valid cruise start date. So uh, if it's less than uh, date time of like, I don't know, 19... Let's say 1850. Uh, I don't know when they started actually doing cruises, but uh, just give it a reasonable date. I don't want it to be 0001. It's not a, it's not a valid date for anything really. Okay, Let's try it again. Okay, cruise was created. Here it is. And this is pretty much the exact JSON that I passed in, right? But I've got a key attached to it now, and it's being stored in our database. But uh, there we go. Ship name, Disney Wonder, all the different ports of call, start date, and it's, uh, you know, it translates it into this uh, ISO 9001, I think? No, not ISO 9001. What is it? ISO something or other date format. Uh, and, and there we go. So I could do another cruise. Let's do a different one. Let's do... Uh, Let's see, uh, Coral mentioned uh, Royal Caribbean, he's a big fan of. Royal Caribbean. I don't know what the name of the ships are in Royal Caribbean, but we'll say it's the uh, King Coral is the port of call there. And we're going, to, we're going to have two different ports of call. We'll be one in Jamaica, I don't know, a uh, particular city. And we'll have one in the Bahamas. We'll make this a five day cruise and it starts in 2021 on, I don't know, October 5th. Send that one over. Got a second cruise created. There it is. Royal Caribbean, the King Coral. Name the boat after you, Coral. Okay, so now we've got, we're putting stuff in. We actually need to get some data out. So you can see I've got this ID here, which will become very handy when we're actually getting uh, one of these out. So. With the couch base, very simple. We'll just say return buckets get, and we'll, we'll shove it into a cruise object and we'll pass in the ID. In this case, looking for an int, what I actually want is I could make it a string or I can make it a GUID. Um, we're just going to do a string for now and we'll return. Uh, so this is the actual value result, I should say. And then uh, return result.value. And this needs to be a cruise. Yes, yes. Okay, and if result. Uh, if it's not successful, if it's not found it for whatever reason, we're just going to say, um, uh, what's a, uh, like say, bad request again, I guess. Bad request, cruise with ID. I always put the dollar sign on there. ID not found. Well, that might be, that's probably a, a not found error, right? <laughs> not a bad request, but a not found. Okay. So I've got this one already. So we'll do a new tab here. And this will give us all of them. We don't have that written yet, but. Uh, we'll just copy this ID, and this should work. 
There we go. I found the Royal Caribbean one. So I've got the uh, Git portion of it done. Easy enough. Uh, so you can see just the idea here is we're getting a result from Couchbase. This result has a number of different properties, including success. It might have an exception. Uh, it has, if it succeeds, it actually has the value in it as well. Um, did it actually return a... Yeah, so it's not, it's not returning the actual ID, but we're passing in the ID, so we already know the ID in advance of this. So not necessarily important to have that. Uh, that might be more important up here. We'll get to that. Uh, what else do we need? We need a, a put, so that's more of an update. It's going to be very similar to this one up there. Um, take off the validation. We're just going to copy and paste the validation in this case. Uh, this will be my action result again. Um, but instead of an insert, we're going to say bucket dot upsert. Uh, new document. Cruise. And ID equals ID. Content equals value. Now, the problem here is I don't actually have an ID. Um, uh, well, I do have an ID, so it's right here. So let's let's make this again a string. So it will. Yep, I'll do that, and return OK. Cruise was updated. All right, so I can go in and make a change. Uh, I don't want to upsert. I actually want to replace. So there's three different types of operations. There's an insert. There's an upsert, and there's a replace. So insert will create the document. If the document already exists, this will, uh, this will fail. It will have an error. Uh, I can do a replace, which will uh, look up an object, uh, a document by the ID, and replace it with the value specified. If the document does not already exist, it will cause an error. And the third operation is called an upsert. An upsert will either create or replace the document based on the ID that you give it. So I don't, I'm not actually using upsert in this case. What I could do is I could replace this post and put with a single, um, say, post that does an upsert operation. Now, you might argue semantics. Well, I shouldn't use post for updating. I shouldn't use put for creating, or whatever. Those, that's, that's a whole other question. Uh, but I just wanted to point out that there, there's another option, the, the upsert uh, option that I'm not actually using yet. But we'll go ahead and try out the put. So that's going to finish there. And so now we'll go over here and we'll make this a put. And we'll copy this. So it was the, uh, we're going to do a raw JSON. This was the King Coral, uh, Jamaica and Bahamas. Perhaps I'm going to give it a third port of call and we'll make this one the Cayman Islands. So we're going to update the ports of call. So right now, if you look at here at the King Coral, you can see that it's got two ports of call. So if this works, oh, the cruise was updated. So if I go at this again, retrieve docs, so again, you see it came out and shows up there. Now, the, the, the tricky thing here is that when I do this replace, it's going to literally replace the entire document with whatever value I put in. So if I only want to update the ports of call, for instance, I have to update the entire document. So that, that can be kind of annoying because I don't necessarily want to pass around the whole document. There are some other operations that allow you to just update individual parts of a document. So if I just want to update ports of call, I could use what's called the sub-document API to just say, okay, isolate ports of call, just update that one and ignore everything else. Don't change anything else, don't override anything else, just we're going to modify that portion. I'm not going to get in the sub-document API here. Um, this is just a really basic uh, CRUD example that I'm working on here. Okay, and finally, we have the uh, delete. This is probably super simplest of all. We call bucket dot remove, and we pass in. Um, how do we just pass in the key? Yeah, you can pass in a key or a list of keys. So I'm just going to put ID here, and remove. Easy as that. So I'm sorry, Coral. But I'm going to remove your boat now. Destroy your boat. Opening a new tab here. Delete. So we'll just refresh this one more time to show you that the Royal Caribbean 
one is in there. And I'll go ahead and hit delete, and this should work. I'll go back here and refresh. It's gone. Okay. So we've got all the crud working for the most part. The last thing we have is this get. And this is returning every single document uh, in the bucket. As we discussed already with the querying and the indexing, this is you probably don't want to get literally everything. Um, but for our purposes, we'll go ahead and do that. And so we're going to write a query. Select uh, meta ID and C dot star from cruises C. Just select everything. This is a bad idea to do this. Um, uh, the other thing we've got here is we've got this ID. Uh, let's just give this a name. Let's give this doc key. Uh, and so um, what I can do now is I'll go ahead and make a query. Query request dot create and put in the nickel and we'll say results equals bucket dot query cruise and pass in the query object there. And then what I want to do is I want to return results dot dot rows, which is, is what it calls it. It's not it's not actually rows, it's a collection of JSON objects that gets serialized into these C sharp objects. Uh, but we'll just call it row. That's what the API call the SDK calls it rows. So I'm using rows there. Now the problem here is that there's no ID field in my cruise object. So I'm, I'm selecting the ID here, but it's not. It's going to go. It's not going to go anywhere. It's going to be. It's going to be just uh, just dropped. So uh, what I can do here is I will make a string called ID. Uh, and now, of course, uh, the, the problem with this, is, well, well I'll, sh I'll show you the problem with this in a second. So I have to make some decisions here at some point about how you want to handle this, but uh, we'll just make sure this is working first. So it's returning nothing because I don't have any indexes on it. Um, right, so if I, if I actually pasted that query into, into this, this is the query, wanting it to run. In here, it's going to give me an error because I have no indexes, so I need to create a primary index. Um, uh, interesting that it's saying, because the indexes are sufficient, but there isn't one. That's another error that I think uh, I might want to make a note of. Another possible bug. This is a kind of a weird edge case, but possible bug in query advisor. And that's with no indexes. Advisor says uh, existing indexes are sufficient when there are no indexes. Uh, that so that's it's not really a very good error message. So uh, I'll have to fix that. But uh, anyway, creates primary index on cruises. This shouldn't take very long. Okay, and go right over here, and now I should get, oops, I just deleted, should have done that. I wanted to do a refresh over here. There we go. So, uh, it's putting null there, okay. I know why it's putting null there, because I expect it to be doc key. Will that work, or is that going to be a syntax error? Okay. So I called it, I'll call it doc key in the query, but I called it ID in the object, so that's not going to match up, so I just changed it. So there we go. You can see that the ID is now populated there, so if I wanted to drill down just that one, for instance, I could say like that, and get that specific object. But now you see we've got a problem here, is that the ID is null. Because when I return a document, as you can see from this example here, the document doesn't actually have the ID in it. The ID is metadata about the document. So, one thing I could do is I could just say here, uh, res uh, I could say uh, the value equals results dot value, val dot ID equals ID, and just, just assign it directly. So it's like a little extra step I have to do there because the ID is metadata. Um, 
about the document. So uh, I think the result also contains the ID. I could do that as well. But it's the same thing being passed in, so it doesn't matter. Okay, so here's the all of them again, and I will just slap this in, and there now the object being returned has the ID. Don't really need it in this case, but I don't necessarily want to return ID equals null either. So what you'd probably do in a more robust architecture is, you know, I've only had this one cruise object, this one cruise model. Um, in reality, you probably have different views of the cruise, different, you know, the cruise is going to be much more complex, and you only want to show parts of it at a time. Uh, so you want to do some sort of mapping layer, maybe bring an auto mapper uh, to just map the parts of the cruise that you want to the actual objects that you're going to pass to your views. You know, I've got a lot of stuff happening right now in this class. I've got, um, this is, you know, I'm actually querying the database in inside of this uh, controller, which isn't necessarily a horrible thing because it's very simple, but you probably want to move that into a different layer of your application, the data access layer. Uh, and this cruise object sh maybe should live in the data access layer. I have a different object, uh, a cruise view object, a, a cruise view model, for instance, that only exists to exist in the presentation layer. So I have two different classes there. I'd map them back and forth. So that might be one strategy, or you know maybe you just want to take this extra step and do this, or there's some other there's some other options to 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 work with that. But just want to keep that in mind. You have, you have to think about this stuff pretty early on is how do I want to deal with the IDs and how do I want to deal with the presentation layer versus the data layer uh, versus business layer and, and things like that. Uh, our, our example is very, very simple, so we're going to keep it like this. Uh, and and it also with indexes. So very early in this episode, I was talking about indexes. This type of query is probably, this is an unbounded query that's going to select everything in your bucket. In reality, that's not something you want to do. All right, so this is probably going to be either a paged view at the very least, or you have some sort of limit and offset, or it's going to only be selecting a portion of documents in there. So in our cruise bucket, we may have documents that represent cruises. We may have documents that represent individual passengers, represent staterooms. All those different entities would be in one bucket. So we want to limit this to say like where c.type equals cruise, for instance. And we want to limit, you know, maybe 50 at a time with an offset of whatever. 50 or for the next five pages we'll offset about 250 that sort of thing so we want to bound those queries a little bit more realistically than what I'm doing right now but uh, for right now our simple crud example with one or two documents in there this is totally fine to give you the idea to get started so there we go there's the full crud example of getting started with ASP.NET and Couchbase the important things are over here we've got this configuration using uh, Couchbase uh, dependency injection uh, extension, very simple to get that going there. And I've got the application stopped in the application lifetime to make sure we clean up the connection when the application closes. And we've got a bucket provider being injected here. And I'm sort of hard coding the bucket name here. There's 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 other ways to do that where you don't have to hard code in every single controller. We only have one controller, so it's not really worth it to not hard code it at this point. But we could. Certainly do a named bucket provider and not hard code it inside the controllers. And honestly, this probably belongs in a, another layer lower than a controller, especially if we get more complicated than this. But that's it. That's all you need to do to get started with Couchbase and ASP.NET Core. So we've, we've done all the key-based operations. We've done nickel queries. There's a lot more you can do with Couchbase than just this, but this is enough to get you started with ASP.NET Core and Couchbase. So um, I'm going to probably take this as a baseline to redo a shorter, um, uh, sort of uh, more, uh, <laughs> with, with less, less of the yak shaving in it, a short version of this video. I'll post that to YouTube at some point after I, after I create that and edit it, give it a nice little, uh, nice, uh, much more smoother tutorial video than uh, what I've sort of stumbled through here on the live stream. But I think that's it for today. I'm going to call it a day here. Uh, I want to thank everyone for stopping in. Uh, I'll go back over here. Where was I? Uh, yeah, so I'm probably going to raid somebody next. Who should we raid? So we go to twitch.tv slash team slash live coders. We'll see if InstaFluff is still going, talking about data. If so, we're going to probably raid InstaFluff. 
looks like Lana Lux is doing some game dev. Very cool. Got a lot of uh, uh, viewers there. But uh, since InstaFluff's talking databases, I don't know what ComfyDB is. Maybe we'll maybe that's one he's building, or uh, it's a tiny wrapper around MySQL. Okay, so it's a MySQL wrapper he's working with. Very cool. So we're going to go ahead and uh, raid InstaFluff here. So thank you everybody. Thank you ever very much for joining me. Uh, appreciate you stopping in. Thanks for checking out the stream. I'll be back again on Tuesday. Hopefully we'll get back into uh, some Entity Framework stuff. That's what I wanted to focus on is getting the Entity Framework Core 3 provider. Get, keep working with that and keep going with that. Um, but so Tuesday, 10 a.m. Eastern time, Eastern U.S. time. So until then, I will see you. Thanks very much for joining me. Oh, had a problem starting the raid. I wonder if InstaFluff does not allow raids. Entirely possible. Whoops. Uh, team live coders. I saw a raid button on there. Uh, looks like a raid. Copy to clipboard. Okay, I don't know what that means. <laughs> uh, Twitch.tv slash Matthew D. Groves. I don't know what that business is. Let me just paste this in the chat and see what happens. Fluffy raid. No idea what that means, but let's uh, raid. Insta fluff again here. Problem with the raid. Okay, well I can't. Uh, I can't seem to raid. So wh what else? Who else is up there? Lana Lux, the Michael Jolly. Yeah, we'll do. We'll do Michael Jolly. I know I c I've raided him before, but uh, let's do it again. It says you already have a raid in progress. Okay, well, he's streaming MongoDB anyway, so we don't need to raid him. All right, well, I'm going to call it a day. Thanks for joining me. Everybody have a good one.